Welcome to today's webinar on IFRS 13 Accounting for CVA and DVA, co-hosted by Deloitte and Quantify. With the introduction of IFRS 13, the requirements for calculating complex variables including CVA and DVA remain. IFRS 13 has significant implications for all firms that measure financial assets at fair value. Today's webinar explores the challenges, risk factors, calculation techniques and concepts for measuring financial instruments under IFRS 13. Quantify and Deloitte have also written a joint white paper on this topic, a copy of which will be emailed to all delegates. During the webinar, if you would like to submit a question to the presenters, please do so using the questions pane on the right-hand side of your screen. I will now hand over to today's presenters, Dr. Dmitry Pugachevsky, Director of Research at Quantify, and Dr. Roman Badao, Consultant at Deloitte. Hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Um, today's agenda of this webinar will be um, on the following uh, five points. It will be about the challenges and the implications of measuring financial instruments under IFRS 13. Um, it, we will review um, the different fair value adjustments. Um, we give this special um, uh, slide on the funding valuation adjustments and um, talk about the risk factors and requirements for calculating those um, valuation adjustments. Um, and at the end we have the Q&A. So, IFRS 13 um, was issued by the IASD in May 2011 and it establishes a single source of guidance for um, all fair value measurements under IFRS standards. Um, it also uh, clarifies the definition of fair value in general as an asset price and um, it introduces consistent requirements for disclosures on fair value measurements. It became or it is effective since January 1st, 2013. Um, within its scope of application, there are all um, transactions and balances for which IFRS standards require or permit for value measurement. There are some exceptions, like for example, share-based payment transactions according to IFRS 2, um, also net reliable value according to IS2. It also um, gives relief from its disclosure requirements with respect to plan assets according to IS19 and to plan investments according to IS26. Um, the standard defines fair value um, as the price that would be received to sell an asset or paid to transfer a liability in an orderly transaction between market participants at the measurement date. Um, the market participants um, take part in an active market, that's the market in which transactions for the asset and liability take place with sufficient frequency and also with a high enough volume in order to guarantee that uh, you have continuous pricing information. Um, exit price, in this definition has already entered the, the definition of fair value. That's the price, as already mentioned, that you would, uh, that would be received to sell the asset or paid to transfer a liability. Um, I have certain gives also definitions on um, different markets. The principal market is the market the greatest volume and level of activity for assets or liabilities and the most advantageous market is the market that maximizes the amount that would be received to sell the asset or minimizes the amount that would be paid to transfer the liability um, after taking into account transaction costs and transport costs. So to summarize, those definitions are not entity specific and um, they are applied from um, the perspective of market participants. Um, IFRS 13 also um, gives information about the applicable measurement requirements for different product classes. Um, for non-financial assets, um, you should determine the highest and best use that is physically possible, legally permissible, and also financially feasible. For liabilities and um, or issued equity, you should use quoted price for the transfer of an identical or similar liability or equity. And if this, is, if this price is not available, and at the same time um, and the identical item is held by another party as an asset, you should use asset premise. Otherwise, 
uh, use liability premise valuation techniques. And um, for financial assets and liabilities, you can measure a group of financial assets and liabilities um, on the basis of an entity's net exposure to a particular market risk or counterparty credit risk. If certain conditions are met, one of them is that the risk management strategy is documented. Uh, the information uh, is provided to the management and also all assets and liabilities in the portfolio must be measured at fair value under the applicable IFRS under consideration. So, um, FS13 um, gives um, an overview of a free valuation technique. Um, I mean, when the transaction is directly observable in the market, in fair value determination is straightforward, but if it's not the case, you could uh, use those free valuation techniques. Um, the market approach is um, when an entity uses price or other relevant information generated by market transactions involving identical or comparable, meaning similar assets, liabilities, or a group of assets and liabilities. Uh, the income approach is when an entity converts future amounts um, to a single current amount by discounting them. And the cost approach is um, when an entity determines the value which reflects the amount that would be required currently to replace the service capacity of an asset that's often also referred to as current replacement cost. So valuation techniques should be selected and then consistent, consistently applied um, in order to maximize the use of relevant observable inputs, of, um, meaning at the same time to minimize unobservable inputs. Uh, IFRS 13 also gives um, indication of what to do if you measure fair value at initial recognition. Um, if your transaction price equal its fair value at, at initial recognition, then you have to um, calibrate your uh, valuation model um, based on unobservable input parameters so that um, uh, to that fair value at initial recognition um, to guarantee that the future measurements reflect only changes in value subsequent to this initial recognition. If, um, on the contrary, the transaction price differs from the fair value at initial recognition, then um, the resulting gain or loss must be recognized in PNL unless another IFS specifies a different treatment, like, for example, um, under IFS 9 or IF 39. Um, as already mentioned, um, IFRS 13 introduces uses also consistent requirements for disclosures on fair value measurement and also gives the fair value hierarchy. Um, so IFRS 13 requires a number of quantitative and qualitative disclosures about fair value measurement. Most of them are related to this um, three level fair value hierarchy. Um, which is based on the or based on the um, quality of the input parameters to the valuation technique used. So um, from level three to level one, with increasing priority um, on the inputs on level one are fully observable. So, for example, unadjusted quoted price in an active market for uh, identical assets and liabilities. Um, that are accessible at the measurement state for the entity. And um, level two inputs are those other than quoted price within level one that are still directly or indirectly observable. And level three is, um, consists, or the level three inputs consist of all unobservable um, input parameters. With this, um, I will go to the different valuation adjustments you have to take into account. So um, to consider um, your, uh, the counterparty credit risk, uh, to see, um, credit, uh, credit valuation adjustments, um, that's the expectation of losses due to the fact that the, your counterparty might default. 
Um, you could also uh, interpret CVA as the market price of um, the default option sold to the counterparty. Um, a simplified calculation is based on, an, on the average expected positive exposure. Um, so that's um, the loss given default, that's 1 minus the, um, the, recover, the recovery rate of the counterparty times this average expected positive exposure times the probability of um, the counterparty's default. For example, um, if you're purchasing a defaultable bond from an issuer and the issuer defaults, so the defaultable bond uh, is worth less than a risk-free bond and your CDA um, is just um, the present value of the risk-less bond minus um, the market price of the risky bond. Uh, XVA, XVA death, those numbers um, could be used um, as price or an upfront charge for an insurance policy against credit default related losses or upfront costs of hatching um, entire expected exposure profiles. Um, the debit value adjustment or if you net CBA and DVA, the bilateral CBA is the amount that is added back to your mark to market value. Um, in order to account for the expected gain from your own default. Um, you could see DVA as CVA from the counterparty's perspective. Um, if one party incurs the CVA loss, the other party should record some DVA gain. Um, also here you could um, make a simplified calculation of based then on the average expected negative exposure. Um, so your DVA um, would be the 1 minus your own recovery rate times the average expected negative exposure times the probability of your own default. EVA um, has some counterintuitive effects. Uh, institutions record gains um, when the credit quality uh, uh, deteriorates. So um, that gives some strange incentives as gains um, only realized on default. Calculating bilateral CDA, so the net um, amount of CDA and DVA um, as the side effect that both parties acquire then the same credit adjusted mark to market value. Okay, uh, this is Dmitry Pugachevsky. Uh, thank you, Roman. Um, uh, fund equaluation adjustment. Uh, this is uh, defined as cost of borrowing money to finance hedging of uncollateralized trades. Uh, Roman already mentioned XV, uh, which is an uh, uh, abbreviation for cross valuation adjustment. Uh, and currently it includes CV, DV, FV, sometimes KV, which stands for collateral V. But now we are talking, uh, we will talk about this triad, CV, DV, FV. So FV is kind of the latest uh, addition to this. Uh, triad, uh, and it should be taken into account when profitability of trade is estimated. Uh, while CV and FV are cost to the bank, uh, DV is a benefit. Um, Quantify was first to market with FV calculations back in February 2012. Uh, after much debate and controversies, market finally settled on definition of FV, which I just gave you, and how it should be calculated. And this supports uh, our approach, uh, which we had originally. Um, FVA is generated by two parts, uh, funding FCA, uh, which stands for funding cost adjustment, and FBA, which stands for funding benefit adjustment. So uh, what what does exactly mean the um, uh, cost of uh, borrowing money to finance a hedging of uncollateral trade? Um, uh, imagine the bank uh, which has non-secure trade. Um, with uh, some corporate, and this uh, trade is hedged um, through a secure trade uh, with uh, maybe not riskless counterparty, but counterparty like another bank uh, with which uh, this bank has uh, CSA, CSA, CSA and is fully collateralized. So when PV of original trade with corporate is positive, uh, PV of the hedge will be negative and um, uh, there will be margin call to uh, pay uh, collateral on this uh, hedge trade. To pay this collateral, bank has to borrow cash. 
and uh, it borrows this at funding uh, rate, LIBOR plus uh, SB. We'll put SB for spread borrowing. And that generates, uh, this spread borrowing spread generates uh, FCA uh, cost adjustment. Um, when the uh, situation is positive, when trade value is negative, uh, collateral call on hedging trade is generating cash, uh, which earns LIBOR plus lending spread, SL. This generates uh, funding benefit adjustment. So total FVA is netted FCA minus FBA, and uh, we consider FVA as a cost to the bank. Uh, what's important to remember here, uh, here is that uh, borrowing spread and lending spread are quite different for banks. So, and we'll talk a little bit about this later. Uh, JP Morgan's FVA report in January 2014, uh, JP Morgan um, uh, announced earnings for uh, Q4 2013, and therefore the first time they included FVA. Uh, it amounted to a loss of 1.5 billion pre-tax. Um, what was interesting, JP Morgan was uh, during investor presentation, they were giving the whole a um, uh, couple of slides on uh, FVA, and there they went through uh, definition of FVA. They explained that option of FVA in terms which are completely consistent with definition and calculations, which I just mentioned. Um, also, uh, JP Morgan CFO um, explained how this uh, loss of 1.5 billion can be could be obtained. Um, the, when derivatives receivables net of cash and collateral is um, 50 billion, um, applying coverage duration for five years and spread of 60 basis point will generate exactly a loss of 1.5 billion. Um, once again, we have to remember that um, FVA is cost of funding, not of immediate um, uh, um, of immediate uh, borrowing of collateral, but borrowing of collateral for the whole life of the trade. So this uh, five years explains that you have to uh, look at the uh, whole maturity of your portfolio. Of course, this is kind of simple exercise, uh, simple explanation, but that explains how you can come up with this uh, number. Uh, they also mentioned that they didn't take into account um, uh, liabilities uh, or uh, funding uh, benefit adjustment for liabilities. So there were, therefore, there was no double counting between DVA and uh, FVA. Um, and uh, they, of course, mentioned DVA. Um, and uh, uh, one interesting thing is that, um, as Roman mentioned, uh, DVA uh, is uh, controversial in the sense that when spread widens, uh, DVA, which is benefit for the bank, uh, is growing. So banks uh, kind of uh, are benefiting from uh, their um, credit worsening. But FVA uh, kind of uh, is an opposite, uh, works in an opposite direction. Uh, when uh, spread is growing, it's harder uh, for bank or it's more expensive for bank to uh, borrow money. So FVA basically uh, is upsetting DVA. Uh, so uh, that was the idea for JP Morgan to start reporting um, FVA. They consolidated DVA and FVA starting with the uh, uh, first quarter earnings which were announced in uh, April um, this year. Uh, they already uh, lumped them together and uh, that was resulting in uh, almost 200 million loss which uh, basically is uh, much less than uh, both of these um, uh, non-netted uh, amounts uh, uh, separately. Uh, we hope controversies are finally resolved and FVA kind of uh, because stop being uh, really um, an F word. Um, uh, one of the kind of most heated debates uh, was started uh, almost two years ago uh, when Holland White uh, published um, an article in Risk Magazine uh, where they uh, basically were uh, very critical about FVA and uh, a couple of arguments they were making uh, were that uh, first of all uh, DVA and FVA, um, they referred to them as DVA1 and DVA2. Uh, that, since they both depend on bank spread, then if you count both of them, it will be double counting. But current understanding, and we hope it's kind of uh, final, is that, uh, first of all, again, uh, FVA should be separated in FCA and F uh, FBA. Uh, DVA and FCA are completely different in the sense that uh, DVA depends on um, 
your liabilities, bank's liabilities, while FCA depends on assets. Um, and you probably can argue that DVA and FBA um, can lead to uh, double counting. But if you calculate them uh, using uh, correct uh, uh, spread. So for DVA, we know we use uh, uh, most often what is used is uh, credit default spread. For FBA, uh, this uh, uh, lending spread uh, is by no means the uh, credit spread of the bank. Uh, you can think of this as maybe extra basis between um, between uh, credit and bonds. Uh, or something of this nature. So if you take this, uh, if you uh, use correct lending spread, there will be no double counting. Uh, second argument uh, which uh, Holland White made that uh, FVA, they said, shouldn't exist uh, because it cannot be derived using standard risk neutral assumptions like riskless funding. Um, and uh, this is not the first example of market incompleteness or uh, assumptions which are too idealistic uh, to derive some uh, theoretical formulas. We know that uh, even uh, when we deal with black shoals, there are price jumps, there are transaction costs which are not taken into account. Uh, this is, uh, we believe, another example of uh, such incompleteness or such uh, uh, condition um, like uh, non-riskless borrowing uh, creates an adjustment to a theoretical price. So like previous um, uh, incompletenesses also has to be um, taken into account with adjustment this one as well. So we don't see here anything new. Um, uh, another controversial issue, uh, can you pass uh, FVA to counterparty? Uh, Roman talked about CVA, DVA and uh, how you net them and um, uh, they together um, uh, constitute bilateral uh, CVA and that it can be uh, uh, basically taken into mark to market. Uh, what do you do with FVA? There is no symmetrical part, like for CVA there is DVA and vice versa, but for FVA there is no. So uh, both counterparties actually have to borrow money and uh, there, there are costs for both of them, so counterparties are reluctant to accept this cost. Some banks uh, will still charge corporate clients for their funding. Uh, some banks probably will absorb this. Uh, for those who charge, as the result, banks with uh, higher funding spread, uh, worse credit, could end up losing trades, uh, losing clients, and become less competitive. Hedging cross VA. Um, there's desks now, uh, traditionally were called uh, CVA desk, now they are cross VA desk because it was uh, proved uh, uh, practically that uh, it's much easier to uh, deal with uh, all the uh, valuation adjustment um, uh, in one place um, in centralized form. Uh, of course, CVA DV is just uh, uh, bilateral CVA, so it should, should be uh, taken together. Uh, FVA as well should be part of uh, same, uh, we believe, same desk or same uh, kind of group because uh, uh, you'll have, you, lo you look at basically same um, exposures. Um, FVA depends, uh, as we know, on positive exposure and the same uh, like uh, CVA uh, also depends on a counterparty uh, uh, not counter on your own spread, similar to DVA. So FVA is kind of a hybrid between um, uh, CVA and DVA and uh, of course should be uh, calculated in the uh, same system and so on. Uh, to mitigate, um, so that that's basically uh, justifies and uh, makes necessary uh, dealing with all this uh, valuation adjustment in one place and, and uh, dealing with them as XVA. Uh, how to hedge XVA? Um, here actually different parts of XVA should be uh, hedged uh, differently. Uh, to mitigate CVA volatility as well as hedge default risk, uh, banks buy CDS protection on uh, their counterparties. Uh, recently, uh, CDS has become less liquid and uh, uh, most of the hedging is done with indices. Uh, hedging DVA is not as straightforward as CVA. Um, as uh, Roman explained, uh, DV depends on your own spread. So to hedge uh, volatility of this spread, um, it involves buying the, uh, your, your own bonds. Um, of course, you cannot sell CDS protection on yourself. 
Uh, so uh, another strategy is to sell protection on some basket of uh, highly correlated institutions, for example, other banks. Uh, but this strategy uh, backfired in 2008 when uh, Lehman was part of this basket and uh, um, uh, with Lehman's default, a lot of banks who uh, sell protection on this had to uh, pay dearly. I already mentioned introduction of XVA desks and the fact that banks report FVA in addition to DVA offset volatility of earnings due to on credit spread moves. In addition to credit risk, XVA depends on market factors. That's basically what unifies all the uh, component of XVA. They all depend on market factors and they all depend on exposures, either positive or negative. Uh, market factors um, which affect trades in the portfolio are interest rate, FX rate, equities, uh, uh, commodities, and uh, so on. Um, uh, credit if it's part of the portfolio. And hedging market risk is an important responsibility of XVA desk. Uh, hedges, these hedges are calculated based on sensitivity produced by XVA Monte Carlo model. Again, here we talk about XVA Monte Carlo model, not CVA, DVA, or FVA, because uh, of uh, a common kind of part, which is the biggest part, calculating exposure, uh, that's uh, all this um, uh, XVA component should be uh, calculated in one system. And uh, here I would like to uh, talk a little bit about uh, uh, the properties of the such system and uh, how to calculate um, uh, XVA. Uh, to evaluate XVA, one needs to run full revaluation Monte Carlo, which simulates market factor and prices of portfolio of trades for each path and time slices. So here uh, what's important, and um, uh, again in uh, the paper which uh, um, Deloitte wrote with Quantify and uh, which was mentioned um, uh, in the introduction. Uh, we talk a little bit about uh, accounting uh, practice of calculating CVA just by discounting um, future cash flows uh, by LIBOR plus counterparty spread. Uh, that can work only if uh, cash flows, future cash flows are all receivables. Uh, they are all assets, then maybe uh, it's uh, not that bad. But uh, because uh, future, even for this uh, kind of trade, if you look, um, the uh, uh, current value is positive, uh, but some paths go up, some paths go down. So you will have outcomes uh, where at some future time, uh, PV of this trade will be uh, um, uh, negative. So it's important to, and for our CVA, for example, purposes, uh, what we call here expected exposure, you have to look just on the positive part. So that's what you get. Um, and uh, also, uh, using same model, uh, you can get positive um, uh, expected exposure, you can get uh, negative expected exposure, you also can get uh, some other characteristic like PFE, uh, which uh, is used for economic capital and which is just the um, uh, uh, confidence interval of some level, maybe 99% for some future dates. Uh, this is example for a uh, very uh, kind of concrete trade. Uh, we uh, consider 10 year 100 million at the money swap, um, interest rate flat 2.7%, volatility flat uh, 25 percent um, and uh, we see this as uh, at the money swap so value today is zero and value in 10 years is also zero because uh, when you evaluate your swap in 10 years there will be no future cash flow so it uh, comes to zero but your uh, these are uh, paths and these are um, uh, values like uh, in um, three, four years, you can see that uh, your swap uh, just, uh, it's like maybe uh, 12 uh, paths uh, positive, 12 paths uh, negative. Uh, it can go to minus 18 million to plus 12 million and so on. So definitely um, you need full recalculation and uh, most important uh, feature of uh, this calculation becomes volatility. And that's kind of an interesting uh, phenomenon because uh, interest rate swap itself doesn't depend on volatility. 
uh, you can build uh, or price interest rate swap easily from uh, forward curve, but to calculate CVA on interest rate swap, uh, volatility is um, uh, absolutely um, uh, important and um, uh, measuring and calibrating this to market volatility is one of the uh, most important uh, part of uh, XVA calculation. And uh, just to prove this, um, this is, um, these are not paths, these are already uh, expected exposures. Two expected exposure, one for 25% volatility, another for 50% volatility. As we expect, uh, like uh, doubling volatility uh, basically doubles this expected exposure. Uh, that's because this is at the minor trade and this is flat uh, rate, so basically we have this effect of uh, kind of at the minor uh, option uh, where when which is almost linear with respect to um, its volatility uh, to uh, uh, calibrate this volatility uh, you have to use uh, you can use historical um, uh, of course uh, movements of uh, rates or other um, market factors but uh, probably the best is to uh, use uh, market uh, quotes for uh, swaptions or for cap floors, that's for interest rates, because that will allow you to um, hedge this uh, volatility exposure, and that's what XVA desks uh, are doing. Um, requirements for counterparty risk engine. Uh, it should be, uh, as I explained, it should be Monte Carlo model. Uh, it should be scalable in the sense that um, uh, there are a lot of uh, calculations. Uh, you have to build uh, a lot of paths, thousands of paths. Uh, they go to the length of portfolio. Uh, so uh, maybe your portfolio is like 30, has trades with 30, 40 year maturity. So that's uh, how long your Monte Carlo goes. Um, then um, uh, there is a lot of calculation. You have to build curve uh, at each uh, evaluation point um, and other market factors and then price your portfolio. So scalability is uh, extremely important. Um, uh, this Monte Carlo uh, should be able to uh, calculate all major counterparty risk and regulatory charges. Uh, first of all, this uh, component of XVA, PFE, which I already mentioned, uh, regulatory and economic capital. Uh, then it should be able to produce first and second order derivatives, including cross gammas. Uh, cross gammas are um, uh, sensitivity of uh, uh, of deltas of a market delta with respect to uh, credit uh, moves. So it basically cross between uh, its second order sensitivity, but uh, uh, you bump your market factor and also you bump your credit. And this is kind of sensitivity of uh, uh, market factor deltas to uh, credit moves. Um, Advanced modeling of counterparty credit risk, um, as I said, it should be able to calibrate to market observables or historical data, capture full effects of netting agreements and collateral, and uh, this is kind of pathwise operation. That's another thing why you uh, need Monte Carlo, and this should be pathwise Monte Carlo. Uh, comprehensive wrong way risk analysis. Wrong way risk is probably a topic for another presentation, but uh, should be taken into account uh, for both uh, valuation purposes, also for regulatory purposes. Uh, you also should have ability for exotic trades to run uh, uh, American style Monte Carlo, where you can uh, get uh, future prices on uh, some exotic trades. And uh, it's not only um, uh, uh, current uh, kind of XVA which you are interested in for the whole portfolio, uh, you also uh, need pre-trade analysis or incremental, and I say here uh, CVA, but basically you need incremental XVA. You also need per trade attribution. Uh, you have um, XVA for or CVA for uh, the whole portfolio, how you then can allocate per uh, trade. And um, you need accuracy and consistency with front office pricing models. Uh, as a summary, um, I will uh, start with uh, my part. Uh, so FVA is integral part of XVA and can be successfully used to offset uh, uh, DVA in the sense of uh, offsetting um, a volatility of uh, 
of your own credit spread. Uh, FEA components FCA and FBA should be calculated with own borrowing or lending spread re respectively. And if you take this into account correctly, then there will be no uh, double counting with DVA. Uh, calculating uh, cross VAs and sensitivity are necessary uh, and you have to run full revel Monte Carlo model. Risk factors such as volatilities become very important for uh, cross VA calculation evaluation if the, even if they are not part of trade valuation. And uh, just to repeat uh, what Roman was talking about, FRS 13 defines fair value as an exit price. It requires the consideration of counterparty credit risk CVA and non-performance risk DVA. And uh, let us conclude here and uh, uh, let us uh, pause for questions. Thank you. Okay, maybe I, I start. Um, you got an interesting question um, about the relationship between IFRS 13 and IFRS 9. Um, I'll just read the question because I don't know if uh, everyone can read it. Um, the question. So the question is: um, One aspect of IFRS 13 is the rules for level two model-based valuation, specifically whether to adjust for XVL calculations. IFRS 9 covers accounting for hedge, which requires you to compare changes in projected and historic model-based value for hedged items, asset liabilities, and the corresponding hedging items, um, the derivatives. So effectiveness measurement and testing, uh, that's the question about. My question is whether the combination of both standards mean that the IFRS 9 effectiveness testing should also take into account XVA. Um, yeah, to answer it uh, short, uh, yes, um, the um, XVAs should uh, be taken into account for the effectiveness testing. Um, the reason behind that is um, that the hedging instrument um, should, or I mean, it can only hedge effectively um, when your counterparty um, fulfills um, and, and pays uh, has, uh, or and it uh, pays paying its cash flows, so um, this should be reflected in the um, effectiveness uh, test or the de degree of effectiveness has to reflect this um, kind of um, potential default of the counterparty. So um, that's why uh, it should be it should be part of the effectiveness measurement. Also. Um, uh, the booking entries are full for values um, for the hatching instruments, so um, the full for value um, or part of the full for value will be CVA and DVA contributions, so um, this should, um, should be the base also for your effectiveness, uh, or the, the, the amount that should enter your um, effectiveness uh, measurement. Um, I got another question here on um, IFR 13. Um, it said it's regarding IFR 13, it is said that FAA is an obligatory part of IFR 13. Uh, not only CD and DA, also FAA has to be included in fair value calculations of OTC derivatives. However, I cannot find the part in IFR 13 from which I could extract that affirmation. I would be glad if the reference to the relevant passage would be highlighted. Um, to my knowledge, I don't know an exact um, reference to relevant passage, but if you, if you um, consider um, the definition of the fair value as an exit price, um, we've seen a lot of financial institutions that they um, price FBA, so FCA and FBA, and um, that influences your exit price, so you should also account for um, this part of, uh, so you should also use this um, FA uh, in accounting. Um, but I will look, I will check with my colleagues and um, maybe I'll find also a direct reference. Okay, uh, I also sorry, uh, have a couple of questions. Um, uh, one of these, is there a wrong way risk in FVA? 
Uh, yes, we think uh, there is a wrong way risk is defined as uh, correlation or relatedness uh, between uh, between uh, market factors and um, uh, event of counterparty default for CVA or uh, your own default for DVA. Uh, for FV, we don't really uh, consider um, default, uh, but uh, here we should consider uh, relatedness or correlation between your own spread. And uh, when we think about FVA, let's talk about FCA, like cost, uh, which um, uh, is calculated at uh, credit spread or uh, some kind of a boring spread which is uh, close to uh, credit. And yes, there might be a uh, correlation between, and strong correlation between this boring spread and uh, some market factors like interest rates and effects and uh, so on. And it should be taken into account for valuation purposes, of course, uh, but also one should be able to run scenario uh, with uh, um, this correlation because uh, that, uh, that's how you can uh, basically uh, run scenario on uh, on liquidity because uh, using this uh, mechanism, using this correlation, you can take a view uh, basically what uh, happens with a credit spread um, and uh, when market factors move a lot, uh, when there is like a cri crisis type situation and uh, so on. And we all know that uh, during this situation, um, your uh, lending spread uh, grows uh, significantly and that can create a, a very, very strong kind of liquidity crisis. Um, another question uh, I have, um, do you use for FVA the same nating set you use for CVA or uh, DVA? Uh, the answer is uh, no, you have to use different uh, nating sets for uh, each of these um, uh, XVAs. Um, uh, for CVA you uh, net on uh, based on counterparty. Uh, for uh, uh, for DV, actually, uh, you also uh, first uh, do on counterparty because it's bilateral, uh, but then you kind of aggregate this because it's all depend on uh, one credit spread. Uh, for FVA, uh, you, uh, because of uh, rehypothecation, so if you uh, have some uh, extra cash for one trade, you can uh, pay for collateral for another trade. So basically you have to look at your uh, total uh, hedge portfolio um, and uh, if this total hedge portfolio uh, has a negative uh, positive exposure uh, then uh, or if a portfolio of your uncollateralized trades uh, have um, a positive exposure your hedge portfolio will have negative exposure and then you have to borrow money uh, to uh, against all this portfolio so basically the answer is yeah uh, you you you, uh, you have different netting set for FE than for CVADV. Okay, I also have a question here. It said, in terms of IFR 13 requirements for the maximum use of observable market data, what, um, what are your the thoughts when entity-specific CDS codes are not available or are illiquid regarding using rework probabilities of default? Should these require some risk-neutral adjustment? Um, our thoughts on that is that if, so first you should look for single name CDS. Maybe your uh, counterparty, uh, um, counterpart has a relevant um, single name CDS spread, like for example tier one uh, banks, um, then you should use this. If you, you don't have access to um, this single name CDS, you could switch to um, uh, liquid index name CDS. Maybe you can map your counterpart on an index CDS, index name CDS, and derive from that your LGD. If even that is not uh, accessible, maybe you find some sector CDS curve, and um, maybe so you can map your counterpart uh, counterparty on the sector CDS curve with respect to sector or rating. Um, if, if you don't have even that, and then um, you might uh, quantify your purchases with historic PDs um, of corresponding rating class. 
the last two options, so the, the factor CS curve and the peak of might uh, need some um, adjustment of your LED. So um, to answer your question, um, yes, um, so if you use sector CDF curve or P curve, you should need, you need some uh, risk neutral adjustment. Right, and uh, there is another question kind of personal to me. Uh, what is your favorite model for calculation of CVA regarding accuracy of calculation and satisfying performance? Um, of course, uh, for each asset class, you have to use your uh, its own um, a model for rates, which is probably most important because rates are part of uh, all portfolios, um, at least for discounting, but also because um, a lot of banks uh, have uh, interest rate products. Um, uh, our personal favorite is uh, LMM model uh, or uh, labor market model or BGM model. Uh, brace got Eric Musiel model, and the reasons are uh, because it calibrates to to market uh, volatilities uh, in a most natural way. Uh, to cap floors, it's uh, almost uh, without any kind of extra assumptions. So with swaptions, uh, you have freezing assumptions, so it also can be done pretty easily. Uh, you have your uh, drifts, uh, which are calculated uh, theoretically. Either you use forward measure or spot LIBOR measure, but uh, this is uh, easiness of calibration. And uh, another thing, you can um, easily extend this model to as many factors um, as you want. You can consider one, two, three factors, uh, um, LMM model easily, and there is nothing uh, really which uh, prevents you to going further. So that's 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 our favorite. I don't know how we are doing on time. R Roman, do you have other questions? Um, there are some other questions, but uh, some of them I can't, uh, or I have to check with my colleagues from the Center of Excellence, and uh, I would answer them by email. But I think the main question for the I uh, covered. So um, okay. So yeah, maybe we'll answer all other questions uh, in the emails, and uh, that's we we will thank uh, our audience and uh, we'll conclude this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Yep. Thank you very much.